People talk all the time about the ways that transit in North America falls short, and of course that includes me. Indeed, pound for pound, I do think North America is behind most of the world in terms of the public transport that's available. At the same time though, I think that sometimes because of all the negative talk about North America and all of the positive talk about other places in the world, which I admit I do contribute to, people get the sense that railway networks and transit systems in Europe and Asia don't have problems of their own. It can get a bit hero worshipy at times, and again, I know I can contribute a bit. Since there's no such thing as a perfect transportation network, I decided that in today's video we dive into 5 great transportation networks that still have work to do. Now, I don't think I should have to say this at the beginning of the video, but I'm gonna say it anyway. In making this video, I am by no means suggesting that North American transit doesn't have its problems, and that a lot of the issues I'll discuss don't exist in other places beyond the places I'll mention them in. Speaking a bit about the public transportation discourse in general, I think North America, for all of its weaknesses, actually does have a strength, and that's that I think we're generally pretty self-aware about how much work we have to do. From past experience, I think sometimes people literally anywhere in the world can get taken aback when they hear criticisms about their own city or transportation system. And that's natural because you tend to have at least a little bit of pride for the place you live. So I want to remind you that the criticisms I'm going to make in this video are all in the spirit of improvement. Let's take a good system and make it even better by fixing some of its few flaws. So without further ado, let's start with number five, the United Kingdom. I had an absolute blast when I got to spend some time in the Greater London area earlier this year, and it was just awesome being able to ride so many functional transit systems, as well as just seeing how much improvement London has made over the decades. But that all being said, London, and the UK more broadly, has an issue that feels pretty glaring if you come from a place with younger transit systems, and that's the lack of consistent level boarding, or sometimes level boarding at all. For example, it was amazing for me to be riding the Elizabeth line around the city. And it was also awesome to see the incredible, massively expensive, but just impressive infrastructure that was used to enable that transit service. But I still find it kind of shocking that the Elizabeth line doesn't have level boarding outside of the city center core and the tunnels at Heathrow. Surely, given the cost and scale of the project, level boarding could have been rolled into the upgrades seen at the various mainline rail stations that Elizabeth line trains serve. And yes, since the Elizabeth line trains actually use a different floor height than regular mainline trains on these lines, it wouldn't mean level boarding for everyone. But at least having level boarding on a transit project that costs as much and will impact the London transport network as much as the Elizabeth line would be nice. Of course, the Tube, which is London's most famous rapid transit system, also doesn't have level boarding at what feels like most stations. And I think that's something that's really missing from discussions around accessibility, since while it's great to be able to go from street level to platform level with elevators, or lifts as they're known in the UK, not being able to easily get on the train kind of sucks. And from my personal experience, given that even in Toronto, where we have pretty solid level boarding on the subway network, people can sometimes struggle to get their mobility devices from platforms onto trains, I can't imagine trying to tackle the sometimes seemingly one foot gap between a platform and a train floor at some tube stations. Now if you want to know more about why accessibility at some tube stations is worse than others, you should check out my London Underground Explainer video. And now let's move on to the next place. For number four, we have to talk about Chinese high speed rail, which will probably get its own in depth dedicated explainer video in the future. So stay tuned and make sure you're subscribed for that. Obviously, China has the world's most impressive high-speed rail network, and probably one which is bigger than it actually needs to be. But when we're talking about things that are excessive when it comes to high-speed rail in China, nothing feels more excessive than the stations and boarding processes you see on the network. Compared to one of the gold standards of high-speed rail, Japan, who was obviously influential in the early development of the Chinese high-speed rail network, stations broadly on the high-speed rail network in China feel way larger than they need to be. Even in relatively small Chinese cities, you'll have high-speed rail stations that feel like they dwarf Tokyo Station, which is the main hub of the Shinkansen network. Which, I also like to remind people, has only a couple of platforms for high-speed trains. Now, these giant stations that you see in various Chinese cities, sometimes multiple giant stations, are super visually impressive, but they can make navigating from one mode to another kind of annoying and not unlike an airport. 
At the same time, having airport style security, which is also not uncommon on metro systems in China, as well as airport style boarding just throws out a lot of the benefits that you see on other high speed rail systems. By comparison, in retrospect, one of the most notable features of the Japanese high speed rail network, to me at least, was being able to show up at a station, take out my ticket, pop it in the fare gate, walk through and walk straight to my platform and onto my train in five or so minutes, something which would be basically unthinkable at most Chinese high-speed rail stations. Now, of course, these things can be fixed, and I'm sure at some point in the future, there will be some pressure to do so, but procedural and operational changes can often be a lot harder to implement because of a sort of company or agency culture than physical infrastructure changes, and so it could be a while that we're waiting. Now, number three isn't necessarily a specific system, but it's systems in general, which are just over the top about fare enforcement. Now, I think when I first started talking about transit, I was kind of a fan of fare gates. They felt like a sort of cool piece of infrastructure that's different in a lot of different cities and that maintains some level of fairness on a transit system by making sure that almost everyone pays. But I think ultimately my opinion on fare gates has changed over time. I talked about this more in a Substack article down below, so you can check that out. I think the main issue when you look at fare gates broadly is that for the price of forcing more people to pay and diminishing fare evasion, they make the transit experience just worse than it needs to be. And I don't think trying to prevent 100% of fare evasion is worth making the transit experience worse. Now, why do I actually think that fare gates do that? Well, for one, they're more infrastructure that can potentially break and that costs money to maintain. At the same time, they can create a lot of congestion and choke points within stations, which can be another thing that constrains capacity on your transit system. Another underappreciated element that's highlighted by people like Marco Kitty on Twitter is that when you have fare gates in your stations, they're likely to be larger and more expensive. And so if you think of a relatively new transit network that has fare gates, it probably had to make that trade-off. A great personal example for me would be the Vancouver SkyTrain, a system that didn't originally have fare gates and had them retrofitted in around 2010. If you look at the new Broadway subway extension of the SkyTrain, each station only has a single entrance. And that seems especially silly for a station like Broadway City Hall, which is an interchange. I think it's worth asking that if the additional cost because of room needed for fare gates and their associated equipment could be removed from all the stations, could you potentially add more entrances? Things like that feel like a trade-off between a better transit experience and just forcing people who otherwise might not to pay. And I just don't think that's worth it. Now, of course, complaining about fare gates on metro systems can seem a little bit silly since most metro systems do have fare gates, but some places take it way too far, adding fare gates to regional rail and trams. On these systems, fare gates often reduce access by limiting the number of potential entrances because transit agencies don't want to install 100 fare gates, while also wasting people's time, since you have to fumble for your card while you're going through a gate along with tons of other people, rather than just tapping while you're waiting for your vehicle. Now, you might be saying, fare gates on trams? Who would do that? And I do wish it was the case that systems didn't do this, but there are actually systems that do. Istanbul, for example, uses turnstiles at at least some of its light rail stations. And that feels especially silly since in a system that isn't grade separated, you could hypothetically just walk around the fare gates and just go to the platform without paying anyways. Perhaps an even more egregious example is something I saw from a friend who was in Amsterdam recently, where they've actually installed swinging gates on the entryway to low floor trams. Now, low floor trams are something I complain a lot about for being kind of difficult to navigate, especially with a mobility device or luggage, but adding swinging gates at the entryways is just crazy. And my friend actually noticed someone struggling to get through them with luggage, which feels like such a silly thing to have people do just to try to make it feel like we're forcing more people to pay their fares. Now, one place you might not expect to have any issues with its transit is Switzerland. And indeed, I think Switzerland, probably tied with Japan, has among the most perfect transportation systems out there. But that being said, among the most perfect is not the same as perfect, and the National Railway Network still does have its issues. One of those issues is speed. A friend recently pointed out to me that you can go from Paris to Lyon in France in less time than it takes to go from Zurich to Geneva, despite the fact that Paris to Lyon is a much longer journey. Now yes, Switzerland, Zurich, and Geneva are all comparatively small in population, but given Switzerland's status as a master of railways, I think the fact that it takes almost three hours to go the roughly 300 kilometers between Zurich and Geneva, crazy. This is especially the case since it's clearly a popular trip with trains departing every 30 minutes between the cities. Saving some time off the millions of people who do that trip every single year would be super, super valuable. 
And I think this actually unveils one of the potential issues with the nationally integrated clock face timetable that you see in Switzerland. You see, unless an improvement project can make a train say 30 minutes or an hour faster so it can move ahead in the timetable and take up the slot of a previous train, there isn't seen to be a real reason to improve its travel speed. Because otherwise it would throw off the timetable and you wouldn't get the pulse and utilization benefits of having that integrated timetable. Now, I'm sympathetic to this because I do think the nationally integrated timetable is a great thing, but at the same time, clearly also saving people some time on their journeys is also valuable. And I think forcing all improvements to be that great in size kind of discourages positive incremental changes. Now, to be perfectly fair, Switzerland is doing a lot to speed up its trains. In recent years, the country has finally introduced proper high-speed trains. With all of that said though, it still feels wrong that it takes roughly three hours to go between Switzerland's two largest cities. Now, I mentioned Japan before, and indeed number one today is Japan. More than almost any other system on this list today, I have to say, I love the Japanese railway network. And I think I can make the case that it's possibly the best railway network in the world. But that doesn't make it without fault. Probably the biggest issue nationwide in Japan is just the disjointed nature of having so many different operators and subsystems within larger systems. One of the best examples of this is Tokyo, where you have literally tens of different transit network operators, and you also have several independent metro systems. Now yes, it's impressive that Tokyo is large enough to justify having multiple metro systems, but clearly the systems would be better if they were completely unified. At the same time, trying to think about different operators and providers when traveling in Japan is an unnecessary annoyance that probably makes the experience worse overall. Now, while there are great pieces of technology like the Pasmo card, they mainly needed to exist in the first place to fix the disjointed fare system that you would otherwise have to deal with. And it is worth mentioning that for a country as technologically advanced as Japan, it is still crazy that there isn't a national transit card standard. Yes, you can use your transit card in many places, but transit cards still are not universally usable across the country, like you might see in, for example, the Netherlands. At the same time, even a great fare card system can't fix the fact that fundamentally networks are operated by a number of different providers, which just leads to a less consistent and more confusing riding experience. So with that, we have five excellent transportation networks that aren't perfect. Now, I'd actually love to hear what you think in the comments down below on what great systems still have some work to do in different places and what those systems might be, as well as perhaps systems which don't have a reputation for being great, but which do have some positive things about them. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.